I recently completed my third playthrough of Three Houses, and boy is it a game I have some really conflicting feelings on. It definitely made legitimate improvements on the last two games, but it also retained some of those games' issues and throws some new ones into the mix. But instead of listing all my issues in excruciating detail, I'm going to be positive towards Three Houses for once on this channel and talk about the one area it excels in, its cast of characters. As far as playable characters are concerned, Three Houses has one of the best casts in Fire Emblem and easily the best of the modern era. They all benefit from the interesting themes the game explores, the stellar voice cast, and also a support system that encourages you to get more than one chain. So naturally, I'm ranking 10 of my favorite characters from the game. Two things of note before I begin though. One, I'm primarily looking at the base game of Three Houses, not the DLC, not Three Hopes, and certainly not Heroes. I don't feel like spending an extra $25, I'm not going to trudge through bland Musou gameplay for a couple support conversations, and I straight up refuse to play gotchas. And two, this has nothing to do with how viable anyone is as a unit, because discussing that along with the writing of the characters at the same time would be jarring. Besides, who can turn into a Wyvern Lord the fastest doesn't sound like a particularly interesting conversation now, does it? If you've spent 5 seconds in the Fire Emblem fandom, you will probably come to the conclusion that Three Houses memes are the worst thing in the history of anything ever. And these memes have gotten so bad that there's a character who I like primarily out of spite for them. You're Okay, so maybe primarily out of spite is a bit of hyperbole, but the sentiment still stands. The fandom basically just collectively agreed to reduce Leone to lol she simps for Gerald. On top of just being unfunny in general, these memes pretty much erase all of the legitimately interesting parts of Leone's character. While Gerald does play a role in her character, the extent to which they do is greatly exaggerated. Besides, seeing his influence on her can be genuinely interesting at points, like when she grieves over his death in one of the best voice acting lines in the entire game. Captain Gerald's gone. He's gone. And we'd only just reunited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sure this is even harder on you. But I just can't... I can't believe... But while that's good and all, Leone gets even better when you perform an advanced technique called actually paying attention and not reducing a character to just one trait. Leone is the commoneriest of commoners in Three Houses, to the point where she's only able to get into Garigmach by borrowing money and getting into severe debt. And in a cast that's filled with wealthier characters, that leads to some interesting dynamics, like her support chains with Sylvain and Lawrence, where she calls them out on their bullshit. She also has the very deep and nuanced quality of just being an absolute badass, considering how she's trained as both a hunter and a mercenary. I love her support with Felix, where he initially dismisses her combat skills only get effortlessly defeated by a pitfall trap. But there's one thing that keeps Leone lower in the list, and that's her bio support, where she gets in arguments over petty bullshit. She does grow out of that mentality in her race part, and it's not like doing bad things inherently makes a character bad, but these interactions are really hindered by the structure of bio supports. They seriously made an argument with a character who can't argue. Once again, this confirms my anti bio biases, and that's why I'm calling for Leone fan bio hater solidarity. When it comes to discussion of Three Houses characters, most of it is on the students, which makes sense seeing as how they're the majority of the cast. But that's not to say that some of the Knights of Saros aren't good in their own right. Case in point, Alois. Now you'll learn! Alois's appeal as a character is simple, he's just really likable in general. Whether he's telling corny jokes, epically failing at fishing, or talking about his wife or daughter, he's just an absolute joy to be around. There's even this really cute detail where the reason he goes out of his way to host a white herring cop is because it reminds him of how he met his wife. Another good aspect of Alois's character is his dynamic with Gerald and Byleth, even if the latter is pretty one-sided because Byleth is Byleth. Alois was orphaned at an early age but was eventually taken in as Gerald's squire, so he feels a great deal of loyalty to the captain and also sees himself as Byleth's big brother. I'd go as far to say that Alois has one of the few Byleth supports I actually like since it doesn't feel as one-sided as most of those supports. But where I feel Alois shines the most is when this wholesome, goofy character has to deal with the cold, hard realities of war. There's plenty of support chains which discuss the regrets he feels for those he has to kill, like his ones with Shamir and Mercedes. And as an enemy in Crimson Flower, he has some really tragic, unique dialogue options for fighting against Shamir, his former partner, and also Byleth, the very person he saw as a sibling. I can't protect you like I promised. I have to kill you and bury you with my own hands. As you might have guessed from my choices so far, I'm kinda biased towards the commoner characters. Of course, with how much Foland's lack of class mobility plays a role in Three Houses' story, the commoner characters are naturally going to be a subject of interest for me. And time to continue that trend. Take me seriously! Dorothea was born to a noble house, and then she and her mother were immediately kicked out when her father found out she doesn't have a crest. And she spent her early years living without a home and without parents after her mother died of illness. Eventually, she became a singer at the Middle Front Opera Company and made a name for herself. But this came at the cost of dealing with some slimy and growth behavior from nobles. I survived kidnappings, attempted murders, all kinds of stuff. But you know what? I broke those guys' arms. Snap! <laughs> it was a thank you for all the trouble they went through trying to hurt me. 
The reason Dorothea came to Garrig Mach was to find a suitable husband, or wife, she's bi. On the surface, Dorothea seems like nothing more than your typical flirty character, which is a character archetype that doesn't exactly have the best track record in Fire Emblem. But while I definitely do think that Dorothea is sometimes a victim of 3S's tendency for avatar pandering, she is not nearly as shallow as a surface level glance would lead you to believe. Dorothea's reason for being flirty is because she has a warped perception of self that causes her to feel her opera career is going to fade away when she gets older. And since there's the whole thing of life for commoners sucking a lot, she sees marrying into a richer family as the only option to have any sort of long-term future. So in the Ace of Course, where she's able to break free of her toxic sense of self-worth and love herself, it's really satisfying. Her background has also caused her to have a strong distaste for most nobles. Any conversation between Dorothy and a character from a noble household is an interesting look into both her and her partner. There's also the bulk of her post-time skip dialogue, where she's become jaded due to the war. And this aspect of her character culminates in a really great piece of special monastery dialogue for Ferdinand's staff. And Ferdy was there. We killed Ferdy, Professor. He used to be our friend. Do you remember those days? I guess what I'm trying to say about Dorothy is that Fire Emblem Three Houses is actually Fire Emblem Two Houses. The two houses are the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. If I had to choose a favorite house, I'd probably go with the Black Eagle. Should specify that I'm talking about my favorite house in terms of the characters in it, and not in terms of the route you play. Crimson Flowers writing is certainly something, alright. It feels like every Black Eagle's character has something that sets them apart from the rest of the cast. And the best example of this is a character who comes from a completely different country. Petra is the Princess of Bridget, an indigenous coded country that neighbors the Empire. She's all around a great character because it's inherently interesting to learn more about her culture through support chains. And Petra's interactions with the rest of the cast are aided by the fact that she's also just a really likable character in general. However, the two main reasons that Petra stands out to me are her backstory and the choice she must make during the time skip. A couple years before the events of Three Houses, the neighboring country of Dagda convinced Bridget to get into a war with the Empire, which ended in failure and the death of Petra's father. As part of the negotiations, Petra was sent to Folden as what is essentially a hostage which is why she's in Garrig Mach in the first place. And when the Empire gets into a war with the Kingdom and the Alliance, Edelgard specifically reaches out to Petra to ask Bridget to join the war effort, which gives her a tough choice. On the one hand, Petra can have Bridget join the war as a vassal of the Empire and possibly forge better relations through Edelgard's new role in what would seem to be the safest option. But on the other hand, Petra and the West of Bridget can take a risk and fight against the Empire in the hopes of gaining true independence. It's a really interesting dilemma and makes Petra the rare three houses character who actually benefits from being playable on all four routes. Aw oh man, sure would be a shame if I had three characters from the same house in a row. But hey, at least it's my absolute favorite character from said house. Victory is assured! Ferdinand is from a wealthy political dynasty and is basically on track to become the next prime minister since birth. And in spite of his background, he's still a genuinely good guy, at least in comparison to his father. Personality and character. Duke Iyer is an arrogant and greedy man willing to undermine whoever he needs as long as it benefits him. I don't know, he seems like a morally upstanding individual to me. While the whole shtick of nobles deserving their power because they can defend commoners is a pretty blatant lie, Ferdinand is the rare noble who actually believes in good faith that that's his responsibility. So his character arc isn't necessarily about getting fucked over by society, but rather learning to understand those who've been fucked over by society. You've got the Marianne support, where he learns why someone would hate their crest, the Dorothea support, where he learns about her distaste to nobles, and the Mercedes support, where he tries to help her with her family situation with a truly noble technique of breaking and entering. And another important aspect of Ferdinand's character is his rival Ruth Heidelgard. He he wants to prove himself as superior to her, but ends up getting his ass kicked in a duel in the B support. In the A support, it's shown that the two have gained a mutual respect for each other though, and Ferdinand suggests a way for Edelgard's new empire to help commoners. We can provide free education for all, and then select the highest performing students for more intensive training and tutoring. I truly believe that people are products of their environment. Finding a way to educate the people. Interesting. You know, on second thought, if Edelgard never considered a bare minimum reform, I'm starting to see why Ferdinand saw himself as superior to her. Liking something ironically can be a dangerous habit to get into sometimes. You'll keep thinking, don't worry, I'm just joking around, I don't actually like this thing. But then one day, you'll realize, oh shit, there's actually some parts of this that I genuinely like. Why am I bringing this up, you ask? Well, uh...
For all the people in my audience who have a fetish for weird analogies, Felix is kind of like the Strangers of Paradise of Fire Emblem. The character is fun both because you can laugh about how edgy and stupid he is, and because there's some genuine great aspects to him. Like, for every aspect about Felix that I can laugh at, there's something else that makes me think, oh, that's actually kind of neat. Overall edgy demeanor? Backstory that makes an interesting point about how Fargus' chivalrous culture results in the romanticization of death. Goddess Tower event where he tells Bio to fuck off? Actually genuinely sweet romances with Annette and Lysophia. Line of dialogue and a support that changes based on whether or not he likes Gandhi? Interesting dynamic with Dimitri where he has genuine reasons to dislike the Blood King but is still willing to serve behind him. See what I mean? He's equal parts a hilarious character in an ironic sense and a genuinely interesting take on an edgy little shit he needs to grow as a person. Also, he has by far the funniest collection of in-battle dialogue lines. You haven't earned my pity. Too easy. Next time bring your friends. Nothing personal! So, uh, unpopular opinion and scorching hot take, but Sedef is pretty good. Judgment is passed! Sedef was one of the four saints that fought alongside Rhea thousands of years ago, and during the events of the game, he's the Archbishop of Garrett Ma. He's also that exact brand of stern on the outside, caring on the inside that anyone can get behind. Among other things, you've got the Felix support chain, where Sedef genuinely makes an effort to understand the edgy little shit, and also the part of the story where you earn his trust by rescuing Flame. Speaking of which, him being a caring father is another reason why he's so lovable. In a game franchise where the overwhelming majority of dads are either deadbeats, dead, or ones you wish were dead, Sedef is there to join the single digit list of dads who aren't any of those things. He's willing to do anything for his daughter, whether it's going all the way to town to get her candy, holding a fishing tournament for her, or retreating from the war and going into hiding with her in Crimson Flower. But the aspect of Sedef's character that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves is how he's not just thoughtlessly following Rhea. He's willing to call her out on her bullshit if need be, as exemplified by his understandable aversion to the whole human experimentation thing. And his Ingrid support also shows that he's willing to see the flaws in the crest system. Finally, if Bios chooses to spare him and Flane and Crimson Flower, he admits that he can't trust Rey anymore, but is willing to trust in Bylaf before going into hiding. Oh yeah, that's another thing I love about Sedef's character. His trust in Bylaf feels like something naturally earned over the course of the story, rather than something given to the boring self-insert protagonist for being a boring self-insert protagonist. Now, if only Sedef could teach his ways to a good chunk of the cast of this game in Fates. Did you really think you saw the last of my commoner bias? Like many characters on here, Ash's parents died at an early age, but he also had siblings that needed to be provided for, so he was forced into a life of crime. One day, he tried to rob Lord Lorenzo, but got caught in the act. However, rather than sending him to get arrested, Lorenzo took pity on Ash and adopted both him and his siblings. So everything went happily ever after, right? Right? Well, three years later, Lenanzo's biological son was executed by the church. And three years after that, Ash would enroll in the Garing Mach Academy. But whoops! Early in the game, Lenanzo rebels against the church and gets executed by the church as well. What makes this part of Ash's backstory stand out is that it's not something from a couple of years before the events of the game. It's something that happens after Byleth joined the church. You see Ash's desperation to find a way for Lenanzo to live, and you see his reaction to Lenanzo's death. But in spite of, and sometimes because of everything he's went through, Ash is still one of the kindest and most empathetic characters in the game. There's there's plenty of times where other characters will comment on how he's just like the knights from the storybooks because he's just that good of a guy. I guess one way to put it is that he is to Farkas' chivalrous culture what Ferdinand is to the nobility. Someone who's influenced by something that has had a predominantly negative effect on Poland but somehow uses it to become a genuinely better person. However, what truly makes Ash one of the best characters in Three Houses is what happens when you have to fight against him. Due to his chivalrous nature and the death of Lunato, Ash is one of the small handful of characters with legitimate reasons to side with both the church and the empire. In Crimson Flower, he's built up the resolve to become part of Ray's last line of defense, while in Burning Wind and Silver Snow, he rebels against the church, and it's the first student you have to fight against. The latter fight is particularly interesting, because Ash is one of the two units in all three houses who temporarily leaves your party and has to be re-recruited. This really benefits Ash in particular, because it tells how difficult the choice of who to side with is for him. And if he ultimately decides to side with you, it feels like something he actually put thought into, beyond just choosing whichever side has a boring self-insert on it. Before I talk about the stuff that Lawrence actually does in the actual game, I have to fulfill my duty as a wacky internet stories YouTuber and talk about a wacky internet story surrounding him. You see, during the pre-release phase of Three Houses, character designs and bios were being drip-fed to the fanbase, and Lawrence's character designs certainly caught people's attention. In fact, as someone who didn't pay much attention to Three Houses' pre-release hype, I chose to play the Golden Deer House first solely because of Lawrence memes. Then, flash forward to the actual release of the game, and the fandom collectively found out two things about Lawrence. One, we somehow predicted 
predicted that one of his supports would involve him touching a girl's feet. Two, holy shit, this guy somehow has a great character arc. A lot of what I like about Ferdinand also applies to Lawrence, to the point where there's a support where the two of them bond over their similarities. They are both nobles of important families who don't have some tragic backstory and also have massive egos. So, over the course of the story, they learn to see things from the perspective of those who are less fortunate than them. Lawrence even has a rivalry with his house's main lord that ends with him realizing that said lord is more fit to lead than himself. But there's two key things that put Lawrence above Ferdinand for me. First, as opposed to Ferdinand, who's very clearly a good person from the start, in spite of his cockiness, Lawrence comes off as comically unlikable at the start, which makes his development feel significantly more pronounced. His bile support has him get called out for hitting on women too much, and there's other support chains like his ones with Dorothea and Mercedes, where his partner rightfully calls him out. So when he comes back post time camp and turns out to have learned the error of his ways in many regards, it's all the more satisfying. And second, which I should preface by saying that I am being 100% serious right now, is that he unironically has the most tragic death in the game. Just like Ash, Lawrence has two routes where you have to fight him even if he was recruited. But unlike the former character who makes his choice to affect himself, Lawrence doesn't like fighting for the Empire and is instead forced to do so because of his father's ties. If you choose to undergo a specific course of action and spare him, he will rejoin your side and convince his father to fight against the Empire. However, if you didn't recruit him beforehand, or didn't have Byleth be the one to finish him off, he dies. And what makes his death so impactful is that Lawrence didn't die fighting for a cause he believed in, he died being forced to fight for a side he opposed because of his familial obligations. In essence, Lawrence's status as a noble and the false standards of nobility that he believed in were what ended up resulting in his tragic downfall. Hubert. Fun, cartoonishly evil character, but doesn't have as much going for him as a lot of other characters. Flame. A lot of what I love about Senef also applies to her. However, she's subject to the thousand-year-old character who looks like a little girl stick, and even though she's a fairly tame example of said stick, it still weirds me out enough to affect my opinion on her. Mercedes. One of the most likable characters in the game, and also has one of the most tragic backstories. Marianne. Wholesome 100 Keanu Chungus. Gilbert. Character who really stands out for being the single most flawed one of the playable cast. He almost made it to number 10, but Leona barely edged him out. You might have noticed how none of the main lords have made it onto the list so far, but as I played Azure Moon and experienced Dimitri, I slowly but surely came to the realization that he's the best character in the honorable mention section. I'm talking about Shamir here instead. Going for the kill. Similarly to Petra, Shamir is not from Tholin, hailing from Dagda instead. But unlike Petra, whose character is strongly tied to her home country, Shamir just straight up has no loyalty to her country, or any faction for that matter. She is only working for the Knights of Saros to repay a debt, and doesn't even believe in its religion or care for the nobles she has to work for. In Crimson Flower, she is even willing to abandon the church to side with the Empire, which may I remind you is an enemy of her home country. Truly, she is the practitioner of the Sigma grind set that we all strive to be. Uh, originally, I wasn't going to put Shamir at the top spot, but rather somewhere in the top five. I just saw her as a raw as hell character that isn't as deep or thematically interesting as the rest of the characters in the list. But then I realized something. If Three Houses is a game about characters fighting for what they believe in, then wouldn't that mean that Shamir, the character who doesn't have any particular loyalty, is the antithesis of the game's themes? In essence, Shamir is the best character in the game because of how heavily she contrasts with the rest of the cast and how much that reveals about basically any character she interacts with. Of course, you've got standard fare like the Leone or Cyril support chains where a less experienced combatant learns from Shamir's unique skills. Then you've got the aforementioned Alo support which juxtaposes a character who feels regrets about killing with one who does not. Then there's supports like those with Catherine, Hubert, and Dudu which all juxtapose characters who are absolutely devoted to someone with a character who has no loyalties. And finally there's the Petra support where Shamir admits that seeing her allies passionately fight for her cause has rubbed off on her and even says that she'd be willing to fight at Petra's side if their two countries fought. Shamir could have just settled for being one of the coolest characters in the game, but instead she became a character who greatly enhances the themes of the story and the majority of the cast by being able to contrast with them. In conclusion, if someone put a gun to my head and told me that the only way to survive was to unironically refer to a character as my waifu, then I would choose to accept my fate and die right then and there because waifu culture is gross.